Hi, 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 Gabriel. How are you? Hi, Lily. Lovely to talk to you. Lovely, lovely to talk to you too. Um, so I'm just going to show everybody. This is unfortunately you probably have the hardcover version. I have just have the galley version. Right. But um, I, as you know, I truly loved this book. This is um, it, it is a memoir that is just so open, so generous in its honesty and um, and you've worked so hard to really articulate a, a real self-examination, you know, kind of warts and all. Um, and, and yet none of that feels uh, fake in any way. You know, you, you just have this, this very, very honest voice that is so musical and sensual and so kind of distinctly Irish. You know, you really, just from the first pages, you know, I felt Joyce and I felt Gates. And I, I really think that people are gonna think I'm exaggerating, but I'm really absolutely not exaggerating about this book. It is, it is truly a stunning work of literature. Um, and I'm so excited to dig in and ask you a bunch of questions about it. Um, oh, sorry, oh, just fell off my chair, don't worry. <laughs> um, I'm just really curious, I, you know, where, where you were, how you got the idea, um, why to, to start writing this, and then, and then how, you, how you went about it. Um, well, I don't, I don't think I, I, I remember a moment when I said I must sit down and um, write a memoir. And, uh, you know, because I, I, I haven't read a lot of memoir, to be honest. Um, but, and I haven't read a great deal of autobiography either. I don't, I don't really know what the difference is, but I, I had been preparing a, a, a role uh, in a movie and I started to sketch out some notes based around images that I remembered from when I was, um, when I was younger. And, um, you know, sitting in cafes and, you know, just, um, to amuse myself more than anything else, I started to uh, to add to what I had there. And I started, as I said, with a series of images uh, from from childhood. And when I formally sat down to to, to kind of you know expand it, I wanted to create as much as I possibly could um, a sensual uh, memory of 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 my, my, my childhood, the sights, the sounds, the smells and so forth. And um, I was kind of, um, I, I was interested in kind of trying to make it real and to make it honest. And because I didn't think there was any point in doing it if I wasn't going to be there. And I didn't, I, I, I wanted it to be uh, my voice. Mm -hmm. not trying to imitate anybody else and so that's what made me nervous about it because I didn't trust my own voice up to a certain point and I think maybe that might be something that uh, is common to writers I, I know that among young actors um, it can be the case where because you don't know your your own inner voice so well um, you tend to imitate and mm -hmm. I think somebody said that writers are readers who emulate and you know sometimes when I would be reading many you know when, when I was an adolescent especially I would put the book down and then I'd say oh I'll, I'll, I'll write like like that guy of course it never worked out quite mm -hmm. like that but <laughs> it takes a long time for me anyway to find to find my voice and even even though I had found it I didn't quite I didn't quite trust it <clears throat> and then because a great deal of it was about memory I I, I thought how do you capture how do you, how do you cap capture memory um, and then I came to the um, 
discovery one day that memory isn't all, you know, it, it just doesn't chronologically happen in the okay. past. It comes between the present and the past. And realizing that gave me the kind of structure to be able to juxtapose the present with the past. And by doing that, making points without having to labor for 50 pages, you know, saying this happened and then that happened and then that happened. Um, if you juxtapose the right images together, it united the past and the present. You do it so, so seamlessly. And and you're not also, you, you know, you're not, it's thematic in a way, you know, you have these groupings linked um, scenes and yet you you let us work it out, you know, where, why these are linked. It's not, you're not hitting us over the head. It's done so, so subtly. Um, and and it's just, it's so freeing to read, to be free of chronology in a way. And, and I do think it, it, it's kind of a generous thing because, because obviously readers, you know, they want to know about your childhood, but they also want to know how you became an actor and what it felt like to be at Khan and all those things. And you give that to us right up front, you know, in, in these, in these moments that, that fit so beautifully with moments in your childhood and you don't feel like you're shoehorning them in, um, which I, which I just admire so much. And, and is so, it feels so instinctive and is odd to me because you haven't been, it doesn't seem like maybe I'm wrong that you haven't been kind of laboring as a writer for the past 50 years. So I don't know how you did it so easily. And so, so, you know, with such facility. Um, and I, I was hoping that maybe you could just give the audience a little sense of, of, of what that, of what, and there are a lot of voices in here, in, in fact. And so, but your voice, when you are looking back, um, on your childhood and, and that, that memory with your father watching the horses plow the field. Would you ever read that for us, that, those few paragraphs? Yeah, um, the reason I, I wrote this particular um, piece was because <clears throat> I remember the day so vividly. Um, and yet uh, my father was pointing out to me that this was something I probably would not see again. And he was right. And the theme of the, of, of the book is about ghosts. And that can be the ghosts of people. It can be the ghosts of, of the landscape. And in this particular case, it's the ghost of a life that has gone, um, or that was about to go. And it was in the days, tractors had come in, but there were still holdouts of men who, plowed in the old fashioned way with, with two horses. And one day we were walking through the fields and it started to rain and we stopped and we watched this man. And that's what this, this paragraph is about. I remember a day standing beneath the trees to take shelter from the rain. My father and I watched a field being plowed. The horses plodding through the black turned earth back slick with rain, a man walking behind them. Hike, he said, when he wanted them to stop, and gup when he wanted them to go on. Crows and gulls circled and shrieked, grub greedy on the air behind him. Beyond the field, a rain curtain covered the mountain. The man turned the beasts at the end of the field, the blade catching the light and flashing. A sudden wind came up, making leaves flap like the winds of insects. And just as suddenly the sun came out and then the last drops, like when you pop your lips together and the hills were clear again. A rainbow appeared in the blue black sky. The horses put their heads together and made a noise like a sneeze. The man held the shaft of the plow, straining this way and that, cutting into the black earth. Once they made a mistake and he pulled them back. They stomped their heavy hooves and started again. One had a white stripe on his face as if painted there. The other had white socks. The long strips of cut earth narrowed the field with each turn. And the man stopped to light a cigarette out of the wind's way as the animals munched from nose bags, having their dinner 
and arrest. He is the last of his kind, my father said. I carry that day like a photograph in my heart. I had never felt so close to him as in that silence. Beautiful, thank you. So, so great to hear it in your voice. Um, I really, when I got halfway through this book, I kind of thought to myself, wow, you know, this guy's acting has really gotten in the way of his writing career. <laughs> and I'm wondering, and then, and then as I went on further, I really felt like um, your acting has really informed your writing and, and that of course acting is so much about voice. And um, I mean, let alone all of the literature that you've gotten to perform, but, um, but voice it, it is so crucial to this book. I mean, you have your voice, but you also slip in kind of seamlessly into the voices of other people like you know, your neighbor Ned and that Russian extra and Mrs. Gordon and your mom and your dad. And uh, you, you slip into their voices and, and sometimes I don't even know if you know you're doing it. I, you know, it's so seamless and, um, and, and so natural and spontaneous. It's like just these little explosions. And I'm just kind of curious, voice, I mean, this is, it seems like voice is a huge part of how you remember. It, it seems built into your memory, hearing, hearing these voices. And I, I'm just wondering your relationship with voice um, and you know, how, how acting has informed it or, or has it just always been there? Um, I would say that there's a huge difference between the interpretation of language through acting and the access to language when, you know, when I, try to write something. It's almost like the voices are in my head and they just, I know this sounds a little bit pedantic, but they kind of speak to me. And if I was telling you about those people, I'd be telling you in their voices. Mm -hmm. And I noticed a peculiar thing. I don't know if you've, you've noticed this. People nowadays tend to dramatize conversations when they're talking to each other. Um, it's something that I've only noticed recently. So somebody will say something like, um, so um, I met Bill the other day and he said, what are you doing here? You know what I mean? They, they act out, they have little dramas when they're recalling the, 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 the uh, so I said, dude, don't talk to me. <laughs> And, and you think this is new? Well, well for me, people have always done it. I, I don't think so. I don't recall people dramatizing little little moments like that mm -hmm. in the way that they do, which is completely natural to them. And um, growing up in Ireland, I think that um, when people when people talk to each other there's always some version of a story that creeps, that creeps into it. Mm -hmm. And I notice it more and more when I go back there. And it's a luxury for me to provoke somebody into, into telling the story, even if the story is about nothing. And, and, and it's, um, it's relating the most mundane event, but they can't just say, uh, I went into the supermarket and I got my shopping and I came home. I, I want more than that. I, I, I want, you know, who they met and what they said and, you know, they forgot the keys to, you know, all, all the little events that make up um, a drama. So w when I was trying to remember these moments, I didn't have to like make a huge effort. I knew all these people, I knew how they talked. And, um, when I put them down, I said, yeah, that's how, that's how my mother talks. That's how my father talks. That's how Ned in the corner spoke. And, um, you know, so where that came from in, inside me, I don't know. It feels like it was always there. Whereas with acting, you, you are interpreting the language of somebody else. And so your job as an actor is to make that language accessible to an audience. Mm -hmm. And 
um, that language is already written. And if it's a play, it's already in stone. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you can't really improvise around it. And you have to try to find a voice that suits that material and try to make that mm -hmm. um, believable uh, to an audience. And the difference between being in a play or being in a film is and writing is that there's nobody telling you what to do which is tremendously liberating but at the same time you've got nobody to say no 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 don't, don't, don't no no go back don't you don't have that so you have to doubt and trust yourself at the same time did you did you write it all all at, at, you know when you really started working on it did you was it just in pieces or, uh, you know, as you, as you were also, you know, obviously um, uh, working as an actor um, or, or did you kind of set aside a, a certain amount of time to just write? How, how did it, how did it come out of you? Well, I really admire um, writers who can, go into a room at nine o'clock in the morning and stay there till one o'clock uh, or, or, or longer and get their words down for the day. Um, that's, th th that's a discipline. And I suppose that, that that discipline turns into need and to love of, um, you know, what, what you're doing. Um, it never quite became that for me. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the fact that I had a day job um, made it less of a, of a, of a necessity. So I, I wrote it kind of, I hate to say it, like when I kind of felt like it, mm -hmm. uh, a bit here and a bit there. And, um, I, um, I always had the proviso that if I finish it and I don't like it, I, you know, I can always like not do anything with it. And, um, I, showed it to, I showed about 40 pages to a friend of mine. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, I like this. He was encouraging. And he said, send it to this woman, Anna Stein, who was at ICM. And she found, and it found its way to Elizabeth Smith um, at uh, Grove uh, Publishing House. And I was on my way to do, um, I was doing a film at the time up on Long Island and the only time I could meet her was, um, you know, at seven or eight o'clock in the morning in a cafe. And um, she came in and she was all business, you know, with Mark mm -hmm. and Paige. And I thought, oh, Jesus, this is like sitting in the headmaster's office and being told, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Well, anyway, we, we, we had a great conversation and she said, um, I like this. And, you know, that gave me the courage. Mm. finish because then I thought if she likes it and he likes it maybe it's not that bad at all mm -hmm. uh, so um, so that gave me the impetus to say I'll, I'll see if I can finish this and I have no idea actually I know this sounds crazy but I have no idea how I actually did, you know did it to be honest mm. uh, I included in the book a story about an old actor who had a transcendent night on the stage. Yeah, it's a great uh, scene. He is just like, he goes into some other, and the audience knows it, and all the dressers and all the people behind the stage know it. And as he comes off, they applaud him. And he goes into his dressing room and somebody says, you better go down and, you know, knock on the door. Why is he so, like, what's wrong with him? And the, the guy knocked on the door and he, the actor barked, come in. And he went in and he said, I, got, I just got to say that was one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen. It was incredible. And the, um, he said, but why are you so angry? He said to the mm -hmm. actor, the actor turned around and said, because I don't know how I did it. And it made me think about, you know, does anybody really know how or where it comes from? Mm -hmm. We're acting. So I don't know. Um, wh where does where does writing come from? Uh, or, 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 or a poet, a sculptor, um, 
where, where does the ability to be able to direct the play come from? I have no answer to that. I don't know. I, but um, I remember a musician saying, a famous musician saying, you know, I don't do any of this. He said, I, I, I'm just like a television aerial. I stick my aerial up and <laughs> I pull these things down from the ether. Well, um, I was kind of surprised when I finished the book and said, my God, I, I, um, I actually finished that because I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm kind of lazy by nature. <laughs> um, then when I finished it, and I, I think uh, you might know this, that I finished, I wrote the thing on an iPad, uh, which I, I wouldn't recommend to anybody to do. <laughs> uh, when I had finished, I pressed the end. Mm went back to press another button so that I could add something else and it, the thing completely disappeared and I had to rewrite the whole thing again. The whole thing? Yeah, there was nothing left. And um, the most genius genius in the Apple bar said, unless, unless you can uh, get the CIA involved in this, oh it's gone. And it was gone. And... Um, I know people will say, did you ever hear the word save? And, you know, there's a way of keeping that, that you don't actually lose the stuff. But I did. And it taught me a very, very, very valuable lesson. And, and tell me how long and how did it feel to reconstruct it? And, and do, you feel, do you feel like it's different, better? Do you long for that first initial draft or have you made peace with that long ago? I think you have to make peace with it because you don't have a choice, really. Okay. Um, and also I find that you can do something on a Tuesday that you might do on a Wednesday. Or you, you might be, you know, uh, 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 if you're on stage, you might have a matinee in the afternoon, which goes much better than the Saturday night. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, you, so was it better? I, I I don't know. All I know is that I wrote the first, the second one much faster and I saved everything with the result that I have about 8,000 copies of every page. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah. that's so amazing. I can't even imagine trying to recreate something like that. Um, when you, you, you have this really great moment where you talk about the fear involved with stage acting and you know walking down to the stage and what that feels like and what a lonely walk it is and how nobody can do it for you and what it feels like to be on stage and the things that can go on in your mind and um you know everybody's uh, you know it's just the worst of things you can imagine you know going on in your head when you're standing there and um so few of us could actually do that and i wonder um I, I just wonder about that kind of fear, that kind of performance fear. And uh, writers talk a lot about the fear involved, the doubt, the fear of failure. You know, you, you, you spent so many years on a project and just, you know, you, your heart's in your throat the whole time thinking this is just a waste of time and I should throw it out and all that kind of stuff. And I wonder because, you know, because it was a, a, a you know a, a more of a side project or something was there less fear or is it just is the fear just different well i think the, the fear was about exposure mm -hmm. and it was about um i suppose one of the things you get used to as an actor maybe more so than a writer simply because the, the profession is more prolific you get it's not that you ever get used to criticism Mm -hmm. no it's just a fact of life and it's part of the business um but because it was the first kind of foray into the world of literature um there was a part of me that said it doesn't matter that's not really what i do and if people hate it well then that's okay but as the time to publication came nearer i began to get nervous uh because i exposed myself in the mm -hmm. in book and I thought to myself um, will people judge me for revealing that um, uh, am, I, am I going to be taken to task for uh, you know revealing intimacies about myself that um, I found um, 
uncomfortable mm -hmm. to to, um, to write about. Um, and then I thought to myself, well, to hell with it. All I can do is do the best I can and be honest. And if people don't like it, then, you know, um, there's nothing I can do. And um, I quote an actress in, in, in the book also who said to me one night, the audience is never your business. You don't write for the audience. It's paradoxically, it's not your business. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's who's going to read the book or see the play or see the film or whatever. But you don't do it for them. You have to do it for you on a stage directly with the other person, channeling these words. Um, and I think that with the writing, I think because we all fear failure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you talk about the various things going on in one's head. I mean, there's always a version, no matter how we're involved in an, in an experience, there's always a version of, did I leave the kettle on going on in your head? Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like even the most intense moment, the, the brain is firing in, in, in different ways. Um, the idea of being transported by the experience into this blissful state of unawareness, I think is kind of illusory. I don't, I don't know that that actually exists. Mm. People who talk about writing and they're overcome with the writing and they, they can't <laughs> stop it because there's, you know, they're just like, oh, you know, people who say, oh, the characters told me what to write and I just couldn't stop writing it like they were, you know, writing down the Old Testament, or the New Testament or something. But I am, um, fear of failure is a tough thing to deal with. But I also think that we have, at least I have, a difficult time relating to success as well because our definition of success is so narrow mm -hmm. and it's it's what the culture um you know gears us towards it, you, you are acceptable if you're successful if you're not a winner you're a loser and to be a loser in this culture is to be um you know less than less than nothing and images of success are constantly held in front of us and you have to aspire to that and maybe even top that and i think um how we relate well how i relate to success and failure is something that i've kind of battled throughout my life and I, I talk in the book about how difficult a, um, you know um, a time I have and still have with any notion of of success um, I'm more comfortable and can deal more strangely enough with the idea of a failure because I know that failure is the place where I learn things Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that if I if I didn't get that right and 10 people say to me you didn't get that right I know that I've learned something there mm -hmm. um, you don't learn a great deal from success not, not really let um, me ask you how does it feel now that you're on the other side of the publication and that that all those worries does it does it feel better I always find that it's more stressful before you publish than after you publish I, you know, uh, and I, I'm wondering if if that is true that you're, um, you've kind of accepted it more that, of what you've discussed in the book and um, and how it you know how well, I don't know is it, has there been any reward for having people read it and I mean I know it's only been out for a, a week or two but has it no longer but I wonder how that feels. Yeah, um, I think I think it was John McGarren who said that a book doesn't live until it's read. Mm. Um, it has no life really. It's the reader is what the, the reader is now the owner of it. You know, it no longer belongs to you. Yeah. And um, I felt that at Grove, they they, they they push back my fingers and they tore it from my grasp. And said, <laughs> That's it. No more. It's gone out into the world. Katie <laughs> Ray and Elizabeth Smith said, that's it. It's finished. It's done. And it's almost like the finality of stepping on the stage. It's it's the same thing. You 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 can't go back and say, listen, can, can, can I do that again? You can right. do that again. 
but not on the stage. Um, so they took it. And as soon as they took it, I said, that's it. Whatever happens to it, happens to it. And now I have a peculiar relationship to it, just as I have a peculiar relationship to any film or, um, uh, or, or a play. They're not, in a strange way, it's no longer real. And uh, I don't, I don't ever want to revisit a film. I, the good thing about being on the stage is you never have to see it. You never have to, you know, ever have it come on a, a television at two o'clock in the morning when you're trying to go to sleep in some yeah. foreign country and it comes on, you think, oh, Jesus, not this thing. <laughs> um, so it's gone and it doesn't belong to me. I don't feel that it's mine anymore. And I don't mean that in a pretentious way. I genuinely mean I don't feel that it's mine anymore. Mm, interesting. And have you been writing all along? Do you keep a journal? Or is yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do I do scribble things down, yeah. If if, if a thought comes to me, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll scribble it down. And I was just thinking today, I, this is just bizarre. And I, people may say, this is totally um, random. But I was thinking today of my aunt who never married, but had a crush on this man uh, who lived two miles away. He was a mm -hmm. farmer and his mother was 98 and she wouldn't let the son get married to my aunt because she didn't want another woman coming in to their farmhouse. And the result is that their relationship was unrequited all of their, all of their lives. They never actually got together. And I was thinking about her today. And I remember going out to pick holly and ivy and moss with her. Um, for Christmas and we went over through this uh, wood and we came at the end of the wood, we came out of the wood and we were crossing the stile and one of her stockings got snagged in a, in a, a briar and she, I turned away from her and she turned away from me and I turned around a little bit too soon and I was really surprised by the whiteness of her leg. Mm. And I don't know why I remember that, but I, when I came home, I said, I'm going to write that down because I don't know what that means. But um, it was a moment that came back to me today, prompted by uh, just pushing a gate closed. So I said, I'll write that down. And honestly, it just sounds like a William Trevor story. <laughs> the, the story, the unrequited, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Man and down the road. really sad thing about that was that although they used to meet kind of in secret because they feared the judgment of the village and they feared, and the mother eventually died, but by then it was almost too late. Yeah. And he developed, and this is real William territory, Trevor territory, he developed um, kind of dementia and um, they put him in the county home. And eventually my aunt um, got too frail and they put her in the women's um, county home. So the two buildings were beside each other. And one of them, she used to go and see him and he had no memory of who she was. I mean, um, that was sparked today. That The memory of that story was sparked by just opening wow. the gate. So maybe I do that quite a lot. I write things down and I think, well, um, I don't know what that actually means, but I have a feeling that the, the, it, it, it's like the thought, the impulse sinks inside you and it finds a kind of a level inside you. That feels, that feels right. That's not just a fleeting thought that means nothing. There's something in, in the recognition of that moment that may be fruitful. Yeah, I, I honestly. I just think you have to write that story immediately. <laughs> really? Okay. Were you, do you think you'll write fiction? Do you write fiction? Well, um, I'm tinkering around with a novel and, um, you know, 
uh, you know, when I say re read a novel uh, by somebody like you, I, my, 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 when I put it down and it works and you've been transported by it and you're moved by it, my first thought is, how the hell did she do this? How do you, how do you sustain a narrative over 250, 300 pages? How do, you, how do you sustain an emotional life? How do you get people um, invested in it and care about what happens and actually get you to it? You did that. <laughs> and get to a place, I remember in, um, in your last novel, the, the protagonist, the, the, the waitress is going out with, um, or she's seen a man who's married. And I remember thinking to myself, no, 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 not him. You can't, I, I guess the two kids, you can't end up with him. No, please don't end up with him. And then I thought, oh, she's another 150 pages to go. Let's hope, <laughs> let's hope that it's not like, so. Um, Good instinct. Good instincts. Most people want her, you know, to, you that, you know at first. No. Yeah. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Um, this this book seemed to me, if I was to describe the style of it, it seems more cinematic to me than novelistic mm. or memoir. And um, I think that um, sometimes language can be like a camera, and 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 you can just like you can move it, you can move the camera. Um, around and see what the camera sees and then try to to capture that that's the kind of crude um, um, kind of uh, apparatus that I use to try and but with this novel and um, you talk about Dowd and so forth I just I never get to the place in anything that I do of to quote another one of your novels, Euphoria. I never get to this place where I'm just like, yeah, wow, that's like, um, I worked with an actress once and we were at a screening of the film. It, and this will give you an idea of what I am not and how some people are. And that's the way she was wired. As the credits went up, she slapped me on the leg and she said, can I fucking act or what? <laughs> And I remember thinking, I'd love a bit of that. Yeah. I'd love to have yeah, some. Exactly. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm just putting it together and I'm just relying on just taking it step by step and not looking to the top of the mountain and mm -hmm. just hopefully waiting for that moment when the Holy Ghost touches me on the head and says, you know, this is the direction you need to go in. Mm -hmm. I don't mean ghost. I mean inspiration. It's so interesting that you talk about the camera because I feel like um, really good writing, you know, is not just like you know, it's doing what you're doing, which is picking out the one important detail, you know, and like you you go around and you 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 see the scene but you have to choose a few details that really work that, that um, make the scene, scene so vivid that it actually produces a feeling in the reader of, of sort of a universal, you know, the reader can connect when, when it gets that specific and that detailed, um, you know, and that kind of visceral, the reader, it makes the reader connect with a memory that they had or, a, you know, something that happened in their childhood. And, you know, it's that trick of how, how the most specific things, um, you know, are, are really the most universal. And, and I just read a novel where, where the camera was just going around and describing everything and it just doesn't work. You know, you, you can't, you, you have to, you have to choose your moments and, and um, you really do that so so beautifully I mean just the scene that you read at the beginning um watching the horse in the field I mean those those details are just you know the right details that just like create the whole thing like poof you know um which I, I really 
really appreciate. I, I, I'm wondering who your influences are. I, mean, I really want to talk about um, Irish literature, but also any any influences that you have and and um, and, and what makes Irish literature so distinctive, um, so different than than English literature or American literature. Uh, and I, I'd just love to hear you talk about that. <laughs> Well, I'll try, I'll try and be as brief as I possibly can in terms of influences. I mean, I started off with Irish literature because it was what I knew. And then I branched out into English literature, uh, modern English uh, novels. And then I went and I found, you know, the French guys like Zola and Maupassant and then into the Russians. And then later on, I found the American writers. And I found people like Raymond Carver and Kent, uh, Kent Aruf, the guy who wrote Plain Song and Our Souls at Night and Hemingway. And I began to get a real liking for very simple, very clear writing. And I, have, I still admire that m more than any other kind of writing, where it's close, very close to poetry. It, it, it's not that different. You're working off images and, and emotions and, and so forth. And I'm drawn, Steinbeck was another one, uh, drawn to that kind of writer. Um, why Irish literature is unique, um, I, I, I'm sure that, you know, greater minds than mine have kind of posited theories about that. But um, Irish literature as a genre went underground in the um, in the 17th century, whereas in Spain, you had Cervantes, you know, writing, you know, Don Quixote in 1492, and you had Chaucer writing Canterbury Tales in the 13th, 14th century. In Ireland, there wasn't such a tradition, uh, but there was a fabulous tradition of poetry, classical poetry, mm -hmm. uh, the bardic schools, which encouraged people to be, um, you know, you had to study for seven years to be a poet. And the word poet in Ireland, in Irish means, phila, means a seer, somebody who sees. Well, when, when Irish history, when, when the uh, English invasion of Ireland happened around 1592 or uh, around then, uh, those schools went underground and poetry became folk poetry and books were not available from then until about the 18th century. People were poor, they didn't have books. So the convention of storytelling became oral. Mm -hmm. uh, so people told each other stories and they told myths. And I've heard people talk about mythology as if it really happened. And, 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 and they will authenticate it, but distance themselves from it by saying, well, listen, this didn't happen to me or it didn't happen to my father, but it happened to a friend of my father's father. So they're saying, don't vouch for the verisimilitude of this, but mm. it comes from a true place. And so <clears throat> poetry went underground and literature went underground. And we developed this oral tradition that was purely based on the imagination of the listener. And so uh, people sat around firesides, which is a kind of a theater and their imaginations were in full flight. In fact, I think Kavanaugh, Patrick Kavanaugh, the poet makes, makes a point where he talks about how in these little moments of life, uh, Homer would have recognized these little moments around the fireside. Well, in the, in the 19th century then, not to be too boring about this, but Yeats and the Celtic twilight came along and it was the collision of the old Gaelic language and the modern um, and, and, and English that produced this kind of unique language where people loved the sound of the language because they had spent their lives listening to language. And I find it a thing in Ireland um, that the sound of what you say doesn't actually have to make sense. It's the sound of it that's mm -hmm. fine, but it doesn't actually make any sense. But you know by the sound of it what's actually meant. That's a peculiar thing. And so um, out of this collision of uh, Anglo-Irish literature, came 
William Trevor, Oscar Wilde, Sean O'Casey, um, George Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett, Oscar Wilde, Shane, you know, it's just an astonishing uh, body of literature that was caused by this collision between the oral tradition and the written tradition. I don't know if that answers. Yeah, that's um, fascinating. And, and, and do you think that the Irish language influences the sound and the, do you think there are echoes, you know, because it is so distinctive, the Irish um, rhythm, sound, syntax, everything. Um, I, I did wonder if that, if English and, and Irish, you know, that's, in that way. that's a great point because I think that the, 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 the Irish language hugely influenced the kind of English that was spoken mm -hmm. and therefore the kind of literature that was written. Mm -hmm. and th there's, there's an amazing musicality to the Irish language. Exactly. It is so beautiful. English by comparison uh, does not have the depth and scope and complexity. No. Of Irish. It just doesn't. No. The sounds of Irish, the beautiful melodic sounds of Irish are a joy to the ear, even if you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, they went into they went in a lot for um, uh, descriptive adjectives, and they could have six or eight adjectives that develop their own kind of mini symphony before you get to the sense of of, of what's actually in the line. But there's no doubt whatsoever that the Irish language, the oral tradition, the fact that people didn't have books, and then the, the arrival of Yeats and the Celtic twilight, and, the, and it, that produced, in my opinion, and I could be wrong, people will argue with me uh, about that, but I think it produced 20th century uh, Irish literature. And when Joyce started to write, even though Joyce would be the last person to say, oh, I was influenced by that, but Joyce was writing the language that he was hearing on the on on, on the street, mm -hmm. Ulysses and you you know that's why I often say to people, Ulysses is better heard than read. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's fascinating. Uh, I of course I have more questions, but I know it's eight twenty three, and I have to I have to start answering <laughs> the, asking you the Q and A's. Um, uh, so the first one. What led you to write this book? The title is Bittersweet. And I wonder if you found the writing of it to be therapeutic in terms of understanding your past. That's a great question. And, and the simple answer is I didn't find it therapeutic. Mm. I didn't find there was any resolution. I just found, well, that's my story. And I think we all have a story and we have extraordinary stories, all of us. And I just happened to get mine down. And it wasn't like, again, it's a cultural formula you know, you confront yourself, confront the obstacle, and then you move on into this kind of happy place. Well, I, I, I didn't find that. I didn't write it to be, to, be, to be therapy, but it's a very good question. I wrote it because it's about things passing and about people who have passed and how that past is relevant to the present. Great. The next one um, is... Gabriel, what songs did you love? Oh, I lost it. Hold on. <coughs> what songs did you love in your youth that might be destined, as you say in your book, to break your heart in age? Oh, well, yeah. You, you learn unselfconsciously. You, 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 you learn song and it goes into you and you associate it with a memory and an emotion. And it's like the song opens up a part of you that you didn't know was there before. It can be a poem too. But w w when the melody and the words go together and they provoke an emotion, when you're impressionable as you are when you're a child or a teenager, when you get to be a certain age, that same song that gave you such joy can break your heart mm -hmm. because it is an instant um, recall of that first amazing emotional moment. I find it hard to listen to the Beatles for that reason now. Mm -hmm. Here's a 
here's a really big and good question that I wanted to get to. What influence did your Irish Catholic upbringing have on your acting career? Well, the Catholic Church understand or understood uh, at a very profound level, they understood therapy long before Freud came on the scene. The idea that you can go into, you can go into confession, unburden yourself of your misdemeanors, your sins, whatever you want to call them, and be forgiven. Be listened to and be forgiven. Mm. Uh, they also had a, a tremendous understanding of theater uh, because the rituals that take place within the Catholic Church are, are um, essentially uh, theatrical. The church itself is a theater, the priest is the main actor, the congregation is the audience. Everything around it is designed to enter your spirit. Um, incense, when you inhale that, it's known to have a calming effect. Mm -hmm. Stained glass is known to produce the same thing, and so is plain chant. So you enter this theater and your spirit is calmed. And um, it is, in, in its way, a, a theater that you never, ever quite forget. Although I don't believe anymore, and I, I'm not a Catholic and haven't been for many, many years, I still love the ritual because I think it's absolutely brilliant and genius. Mm. Thanks. What do you consider the single most important event or decision or influence in your life? Um, I don't think there's any such thing. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there, there, there are a few things that I can say, yeah, I, I did that. But, but I think we're making decisions like that all the time. Some tiny decisions. Like uh, when I told the story in the beginning of the, the book about how my mother met my father. That was a series of tiny events that brought her to a doorway where it was raining and my father happened to be standing. So that changed her into her life. It's why I'm here. And as she said to me, if I had matches that night and was able to light my own cigarette rather than your father giving me a, a light for my cigarette, you wouldn't be here. So, you know, there are big decisions in life, but it's the, the, the culmination, the cumulative effect also of the tiny decisions that one makes too. Yeah. Um, this person is saying, just a comment really, as a child of elderly parents and the mother of two young men, I felt a gut kick at the very end when you wrote on page 194, yet I resented your desperate need for me, your silent hurt when I withdrew, but I remember you at the most unexpected moments. Alas, isn't this so universal a sentiment between child and parent? Unfortunately, we take too long to appreciate our parents and often run out of time. Well, that's so true. That's absolutely so true. One of the ghosts that walk behind me in my life uh, is my mother and father. And as I said, you know, um, I listened to my father, but I never heard him until, you know, he was long, long dead. And I, I, I don't know if I'm the only one who feels that when you're a child, you need your mother more than anything. If she goes to another room, you cry. Um, but then there comes a time when you're, when you're an adult and her need for you still to be a child is great. She doesn't want to let you go in a way. And so you feel as an adult, don't do this because if you do this to me, I, I lose the identity that I have and you just want to swallow me and make me a child again. And, and I found that bit hard to write because I didn't want to feel that I was betraying my mother either. But I did feel that very strongly from her and feel it from my father. But um, the need to possess, the need, the need to stop you from moving on, you know, yeah. Um, have your siblings, oh, it keeps disappearing on me, sorry. Have your siblings read the book and if so, do they have many of the same memories? Well, um, I haven't asked them mm -hmm. and they haven't told me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
it's entirely their decision. I know they have different memories to me and I know they would interpret them in different ways. Yeah. Of course, that we would have similar memories, but it's very difficult for a family member to come along and look at something like this and say, um, okay, that's how you interpreted it. Mm -hmm. But you know, we all have the right to interpret reality in the way that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't force it or ask anybody, honestly, to, to read the book uh, that's close to me. And they're the ones I worried about more, more than anything, you know. Mm. And, and yet, um, I can't think of anything in there that would be upsetting to a sibling. But of course, no. yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't feel like you No, I, I think anybody else's privacy or anything like that. No, because everybody who's in the book is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, I deliberately didn't include anybody who's alive. And it's about, you know, what ghosts do we walk with? We walk with the ghosts of our fathers, our mothers, our grandfathers, our great grandfathers. That's an old Native American Indian belief that the ancestors walk with you. And that's where the title came from. Mm -hmm. But the ghost of memory, the ghost of regret, the, um, the ghost of uh, um, love that didn't work out, um, all those things that, um, that follow us. That's really what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some psychologists and psychoanalysts think that memory is constructed that each time we remember something the memory is influenced by where we are in the moment of recall what we have experienced in our lives trans transforms the memory I wonder if while writing your memoir you experienced your memories as slippery or difficult to hang on to and how you might have captured memory as frozen in time yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question about, about what memory actually is. An extreme example of what memory is, like you go back to the house where you were born and you walk into it and you say, Jesus, it's much smaller than I thought it was. <laughs> um, that's an extreme example. Um, sometimes there's a very, very thin line between memory and imagination. And that's one of the things I struggled with was to say, is this what I'm imagining or is this what really happened? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to say, look, I, I have to use my imagination here to recreate this moment because a memoir cannot be just utterly factual. Then it just becomes right. like, a, you know, it has to be, you have to recreate the memory through sensual sense recall and that involves some imagination and some rearranging of time uh, and and an incident but you can't be untrue to the basic to the basic fact um, <clears throat> and in all of these things that I wrote about like I didn't want to admit that I betrayed people in my life I didn't want to admit that but then I realized we all betray people all the time. Yeah. And we betray ourselves even. And we, we betray even in our heads, the people we love the most. So betraying people is not something that I needed to be ashamed of. It needed me to say, I'm gonna put this down and hopefully people will say, yeah, I know what you mean. I've done that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh who i have another question who is on the scene in irish in irish writing community today in the irish writing community today what trends do you see emerging in the irish literary community well that's an interesting question too because there was a time when the irish novel was regarded as a like they used to say that every irish novel ended at dunleary pier with the with the boat going to england <laughs> then, then there was a um there was a kind of I, I would say a pastoral, um, the pastoral novel, the, the rural novel, uh, exemplified by people like, say, the early Edna O'Brien or yeah. John Garner or people, or people like that. Um, what's happened, I think, in, in, in recent Irish fiction is that you have uh, a moving into the very modern world. 
mm-hmm. a, a desire to put that kind of pastoral rural mm-hmm. um, old Ireland behind well and it's fantastic people like Colin Barrett and Sally Rooney and they, they, they could almost be from anywhere in a, in a weird way and they've embraced a kind of a Tarantino-esque version of Ireland that's not um um that's not what the writing of the 50s, 60s and 70s was about. But I would say that what interests me is going back and looking at recent history and looking at how we became who we are now. Uh, Because there's a tendency among that rush to distance themselves from the traditional Irish novel to say, that doesn't belong to us anymore. We're not that anymore. Mm -hmm. But we are that. We're very much that. Mm-hmm. And William Trevor and John McGarden and Edna O'Brien and, and uh, people like that are as relevant because the emotions that they talk about have not changed. Mm-hmm. And other repressions have come in to take the place of the church. Mm-hmm. They're maybe more sophisticated, but they're still there. And what they deal with is the characters fighting repression. In their particular case, it was the church. But a young Irish writer now might be saying to you, what I have to fight against now is the corporatizing of uh, Irish life. That could be, the, that could be the, the obstacle that they have to overcome in their writing, for example. Interesting. Um, would you want there to be a movie or TV version of this memoir? What would you like to see in it if there was? Well, one of my favorite directors is an English director called Terence Davies. I don't know if, any, if, uh, if people know his work, but he, he, he directed and wrote two absolutely beautiful films called The Long Day Closes and Distant Voices, Still Lives. And he makes, out of each tiny moment, he makes huge statements um, I'll give you an example. The mother is looking out the window and she's washing the dishes and she's being watched by her son through the banisters and she's singing to herself. If you were the only boy in the world, if, if I were the only girl in the world and you were the only boy and she's not singing it in tune, she's not a good singer. But as she looks out the window, you realize she's yearning for something. And it's in that beautiful moment of just her singing to herself and washing the dishes and then looking up and you say, well, and the movies, both those movies are full of beautiful moments like that. There's no greater uh, director of music and image than Terence Davies. And I thought when I was doing this, like there are sections of it that I could take out and Terence Davies, the earlier stuff and go up to the, about the age of 12. But it, it, it wouldn't be a movie that, you know, um, would be an action movie. It would be a slow meditative movie. And I don't know if there's any great demand for that anymore. I think so. <laughs> I think well, it was. That. I don't uh, know is the answer really, but it, maybe, maybe. Have you come in to wrap it up for us? Yes, I think we're <laughs> out of time. Uh, as, as, as I could sit here and listen to you both talk all night long, but um, I don't want to keep you all night. So thank you both so much for joining us. What a wonderful conversation. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Thank you, um, uh, Lily, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk. We'll get to talk again.